let's come to AGI. Yeah. What is AGI? And because up until now, we're talking about intelligence that's not human. It can't make judgments. It can't switch tasks. Yes. It can't multitask. It can just be built up to do an one enormous thing. one thing, even though that might be massively intrusive, as we've talked about with surveillance technology. Correct. But now we're talking about something different altogether. General. Yes, artificial we are. General intelligence means... Well, it means several things. The rough idea is to have a system that can do everything and more that human intelligence can do, do it better, do it faster, and so on, a kind of superhuman intelligence, which you could think of possibly as, at least in its initial stages, being built up out of a whole lot of separate narrow AI systems, building them up, and that will surely be done to a large extent. But Research on AGI, and of course it's the stuff of dreams, it's the stuff of science fiction, so people absolutely love it. And interest in it moves in two very distinct directions. There's first of all the attempt to build machines to do it, that is that are based on silicon, computer, plastic, metal, all that kind of stuff. and. Then there is the idea of taking existing human beings and enhancing them with bioengineering, drugs, all that kind of thing, even incorporating various aspects of technology so that you're making a cyborg, a cybernetic organism, a combination of biology and technology to move into the future so that we move beyond the human. And this is where the idea of transhumanism comes in, moving beyond the humans. And of course, the view is of many people that humans are just a stage in the gradual uh, evolution of, of biological organisms that have developed according to no particular direction through um, the blind forces of nature. But now we have intelligence, so we can take that into our own hands and begin to reshape the generations to come and make them according to our specification. Now that use, raises huge questions. The first one is, of course, as to identity. What are these things going to be? And who am I in that kind of a, a situation? Now, AGI, I mentioned, is something that science fiction deals with a lot. The reason I take it seriously is it's not only science fiction writers that take it seriously. For example, one of our top scientists, possibly the top scientist, uh, who is our uh, astronomer royal, Lord Martin Rees. He uh, takes this very seriously. He says, in some generations hence, um, we might effectively merge with technology. Now, that idea of humans merging with technology is, again, very much in science fiction. But the fact that some scientists are taking it seriously means in the end that the general public are going to be filled with these ideas, speculative on the one hand, but serious scientists espousing them on the other, so that we need to be prepared and get people thinking about them, which is why I wrote my book. And in particular in that book, I engaged not with a scientist, but with a historian, Yuval Noah Harai, uh, yeah. an Israeli historian. Can I who, interrupt for a moment? Yes, just of to, course you can. To quote something that he said, yes, just to sure. frame this so beautifully. He actually said this, because I'm glad you've come to him. We humans should get used to the idea that we're no longer mysterious souls. We're now hackable 
animals. Everybody knows what being hacked means now. And once you can hack something, you can usually also engineer it. Mm-hmm. I'll just put that in for our, our listeners uh, as you go on with uh, your yeah, interactions well, sure. with this man. Uh, that's a typical Harari remark. And he wrote two major best-selling books, one called Sapiens, Homo Sapiens, Human Beings, and the other... Yeah. Homo Deus, and it's with that second book that I interact a great deal because it has huge influence around the world. And what he's talking about in that book is re-engineering human beings and producing Homo Deus, spelt with a small d. He says, think of Greek gods, turning humans into gods, something way beyond their current capacities and so on. Now, I'm very interested in that uh, from a philosophical and from a biblical perspective, because that idea of humans becoming gods is a very old idea. And it's being revived in, in, in a very big way. Now, to make it precise, or more precise, Harari sees the 21st century as having two major agendas, according to him. The first is to, as he puts it, to solve the technical problem of physical death so that people may live forever. They can die, but they don't have to. And he says, technical problems are technical solutions. And that's where we are with physical deaths. That's number one. The second agenda item is to massively enhance human happiness. Humans want to be happy. So we've got to do that. How are we going to do that? Re-engineering them from ground up, genetically, every other way. Drugs, et cetera, et cetera. All kinds of different ways adding technology, implants, all kinds of things, until we move the humans from the animal stage, which he believes happened through no plan or guidance. We, with our superior brain power, we'll turn them into superhumans. We'll turn them into little gods. And of course, then comes the massive range of speculation. If we do that, will they eventually take over? and so on and so forth. So that is transhumanism connected with artificial intelligence, connected with the idea of the superhuman. And people love the idea. And you probably know there are people, particularly in the USA, who've had their brains frozen after death, the hope that one day they're going to be able to upload their contents onto some silicon-based thing that will endure forever. And that will give them some sense of immortality. Now, if you notice those two things, John, solving the problem of physical death, re-engineering humans to become little gods, that has all to do with wanting immortality. And as a Christian, I have a great deal to say about that because What's happening, I believe, in the transhumanist, the desire for that is a parody on what Christianity actually is all about. Doesn't it to some extent, though, reflect that I think the very great majority of us are conscious that deep down we don't want to think we'll come to an end? Oh, no, we don't. I, I'm an individual who actually has no great aspiration to live to an advanced old age. Well, I'm the same. Um, frankly, um, I don't not want on to. this uh, situation, no. no. Um, not to say I don't enjoy life, doesn't mean no. that at all. It just means I don't aspire to great physical old age, yes. frailty and what have you. Um, and I have a different perspective on what happens after that. But deep down, I don't want to think it ends with no. that physical death. And I think that's pretty much hotwired into all of us. I think it's hardwired and yeah. that's important. Uh, this business of what's hardwired into human beings version 101, so to speak, I think is vastly important. And many years ago, I came across that idea in the moral sense. C.S. Lewis talking about in his book, and it's relevant to what we're talking about at the moment, the abolition of man as an appendix at the end, where he points out that all around the world, look at every culture, they may differ, but they've got certain moral rules in common. 
It looks as if morality is hardwired. I believe it is by a benevolent creator. But now we come, we come up to this and uh, we see that uh, there's hardwiring again uh, at this particular level. God has set eternity in the human heart. Now, of course, that's a theistic perspective. But if you take the atheistic take on it, then you've got to explain where it comes from. And again, I found C.S. Lewis, as always, right on the money, so to speak. He, he makes the point, and I'm going to paraphrase it slightly. It would be very strange to find yourself in a world where you got thirsty and there was no such thing as water. Yeah. Now, I think that's a very powerful thing, that longing. And C.S. Lewis has written a great deal about it, a brilliant essay called The Weight of Glory. That longing for another world implies, and these are not his words, but they're his sentiments, that we were actually made for another world. Now, I feel that the transhuman quest is an expression of the fact that we're hardwired with a longing for something transcendent.